Let's take a closer look at tolerance because tolerance is part of our defense structure that has been insufficiently examined in the past. The classic case of the cost of inflammation is the 1918 flu epidemic. That lasted from about January 1918 to December 1920. It infected about 500 million people and it killed between 50 and 130 million people. So at that time, that was about 3% of the world population died in that one epidemic. Most of the victims, this is interesting, most of the victims were healthy young adults who had strong immune responses. The 1918 virus has been sequenced from an Alaskan woman reconstructed and used to infect macaques. My wife met a man who had been in a village in Alaska as an infant. A missionary who had the flu came to that village. All the adults in the village got the flu and they were dying. The mother of this man took him as a baby, he was about six or eight months old, and put him into a kayak and put him in the river. And the kayak went downstream and everyone in the village died. He grew up and in the 1950s, he was a reasonably functional adult. Unfortunately, he later died of alcoholism. But it was exactly like Moses in the bulrushes. That really happened. The entire village was wiped out. So what was going on is that the flu virus was eliciting an, a maladaptive overexpression of cytokines and chemokines, a so-called cytokine storm. And it was promoting a massive inflammatory response in the lungs that flooded the lungs with fluid and then they became a beautiful environment for bacteria to multiply in and most of the victims of that epidemic died of secondary bacterial pneumonia. If we want to prevent a pandemic, and if we have not succeeded in developing an effective vaccine, then the second line of defense will have to be management of the inflammatory response. Here is the age distribution of mortality. And uh, so this is clinical and pneumonia mortality. So the blue line is the people who got flu and the red line, this one here, is people who died of pneumonia. And you can see that this peak here of pneumonia is right at about 20 to 25 years of age. So those were the help people with the healthiest immune systems and it was the inflama inf inflammation that was actually setting up the infection that killed them. My mother was actually eight years old when she got the infection and she had a fever of about 107. It put her down for about a week to 10 days. And she remembers hallucinating at the height of her fever during this flu epidemic, and she saw spiders crawling on the ceiling. So she retained antibodies against that H1N1 virus until she died about 13 years ago in, uh, in 1999. It's not just epidemics that produce these kinds of responses and, it's, and uh, death by an overexpression of inflammation is not the only possible outcome. When childhood disease goes down, there is also lower adult mortality. At the same age, Swedes became physiologically younger. You can see this is the annual proportion of people dying. You can see that this is dropping as we go from 1751 up to 1931. So this is the 1750s and this is the 1930s here. And basically what's going on is that a 65 year old Swede in 1930 had the ability to resist infection and other challenges that a 45 year old Swede would have had about 200 years earlier. We know that childhood disease causes inflammation. We know that inflammation increases the risk of heart disease and cancer. 
So there may be a connection here. However, this is a correlation, and it's not the only possible explanation for the pattern. Let's take a closer look at what's going on with tolerance and resistance. Here we have on the x-axis pathogen burden. So as you go to the right here, there are more and more pathogens in the body. And on the y-axis, we have host fitness. So uh, how likely is it that the host will die? What is happening to the patient? The blue genotype is a less resistant genotype, and the red genotype is a more resistant genotype. Now let's take a look at the same X and Y axes, but now let's to look at genotypes that differ in tolerance. So basically the blue line here is the less tolerant genotype. The red line is the more tolerant genotype. The idea here is that as the pathogen increases its density in the body of the host, the more tolerant genotype manages to maintain its fitness at a higher level even though the pathogen is abundant. So the main idea on tolerance is that the host will use inflammation to reduce the intensity of an infection until the cost of the immune response becomes larger than the cost of infection in the absence of inflammation. So these two things are being played off in the body. And this is a set point, and if it's dysregulated, then you can get an inappropriate response that can lead to disease in either direction, either because the infection hasn't been properly controlled or because inflammation has been too great. So it's a balancing act. A classic case of tolerance is simian immunovirus, not human immunovirus, HIV, but simian immunovirus in its natural host, so African green monkeys. They have this viral pathogen, and it replicates in them, and it produces viral loads in them that are similar to the amount of virus circulating in a human who has AIDS, but the monkeys do not develop the disease. The mechanisms that they have include these. They can resolve the immune reaction soon after infection. There are fewer target cells infected, and they are protected from other infant transmission. You have to remember that these are diseases where the virus is infecting T cells. It's infecting cells in the immune, in the immune system. So they are reacting by changing the sensitivity of their immune cells to infection by the virus. If we take a closer look at this, what's going on is the first level of reaction is that they, down, they, they resolve their innate immune response. They down-regulate uh, the way that some of their cell populations are responding. They maintain the mucosal integrity and they keep T helper cells of a particular sort in their gut mucosa. And they limit then the infection of the CD4 plus T cells. Those are the ones that are the weak point in our system for HIV infection. That gives them a low level of chronic immune activation. They have very little um, bystander pathology from this. They have low levels of CD4 T cell activation. So actually, uh, you can think of the CD4 plus T cells as sort of the food on which SIV would be feeding, and the body is making little of that available to them. Uh, and they preserve their ability to keep an adequate level of this particular population of T cells circulating. That means they don't progress to AIDS. So this is a sign that there has been a long-term co-evolution between the virus and the host, and the host has tweaked its immune system in a way that it allows it not to get sick. There are other elements in this. The virus has evolved, so the SIV virus has specific properties 
specific accessory proteins that reduce its impact on the host. The host has evolved, as, as we've just seen. They avoid progression to AIDS by limiting their immune activation and by managing to downregulate the immune response in ways that uh, reduce damage. They also maintain the integrity of their gut mucosal barrier. And they do that by preserving the mucosal immune environment. This is something that gets eroded in AIDS. Now, that's just one example, but what about the big picture? Most of us are chronically infected by some virus and we tolerate it. We have a big virome. Here, each bar here is a different kind of virus, okay? Here is HIV over here. Over here we have a polyoma virus. Over here we have uh, hepatitis viruses of various types. Uh, and this is the estimated number of infected individuals on the planet who have each kind of virus. And when you, uh, and this is in millions, okay? So if you have someone with this number of people being infected by these viruses, that's everyone on the planet. So this means that all of us are carrying a lot of viruses around in us that have the capacity to produce disease, but we are tolerating it. We have figured out how to deal with it. HIV, of course, is an exception. Here are some examples of chronic viral infections. This is a big complicated table, but let me read off a few names for you. Genital herpes uh, is caused by herpes simplex, and normally in normal hosts it causes genital sores and things like that, but that can become quite severe. Uh, hepatitis B viruses normally will cause acute hepatitis, but they can cause cirrhosis of the liver, they can cause cancers and things like that. So there are many different viruses that cause either an acute infection, which is then resolved, but they remain in our bodies and we tolerate them, or they can erupt at a later date and they can cause something quite severe. We are coexisting with a huge community of viruses. So chronic infection is an alternate strategy both for the virus and for the host. So let's contrast the acute infection with the chronic infection. In the acute infection, the virus enters, it spreads through the body, it is causing tissue damage, cells are being lysed, things like that. The virus is rapidly replicating and it is undergoing adaptation in the body. The immune strategy is to initially react with innate immunity, then antigens will be rec recruited, there will be clonal expansion of lymphocytes, the whole adaptive immune system will come into uh, play. Then there is kind of a decision point. And if it leads to recovery, then the damaged cells will be cleared out, the virus will be eliminate, eliminated, and there will be a recruitment of T and B memory cells. If the infection, however, becomes chronic, that's the other possibility, that's a tolerance case, then there is continuous presence of antigen. There is continuous uh, tissue damage at a certain level. The virus is becoming uh, either continuously replicating or becoming latent. And the immune effect is to dampen the response and it, the immune system is then sort of chronically activated and there is a bit of immunopathology. So both of these things can happen and there are going to be costs to tolerating the infection. So to summarize, if an infection occurs, there is a basic decision. Should the, deci should the infection be resisted or should it be tolerated? That will depend on the benefits and costs of each. There are three strategies used in various combinations and the choice is dictated by the costs. Typically, it goes like this. If possible, avoid the infection. If you can't avoid it, resist it, and if you can't resist it, tolerate it. 
Which of these strategies is selected in which order depends on how much it costs. And that, by the way, may not be optimal. After all, a mistake can be made in a decision, and that can lead to a pathology. A major cost of resistance is immunopathology. And the classic case of that is the bacterial pneumonia that occurred in the 1918 flu epidemic. We all are tolerating chronic viral infections all of the time. And uh, we pick them up over the course of our life. And the costs of that tolerance may be part of our aging process.